But yeah, that, that's a fascinating story. So Dorothy Stratton's terrible, you know, story. Her, her, she was murdered by her boyfriend Paul Snyder, ex-husband rather. No, still husband. I think they yeah. weren't divorced yet. And uh, and it's, it's like, okay, so it was a murder suicide, and it must have been her mother that handled the array. No, Bogdanovich. Bogdanovich did. She was Canadian as well, and she was also cremated. Really? Yes. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Bill Pierce picked her up from the coroner's office took her directly to the crematory and then it was the urn in this beautiful mahogany casket oh fascinating today's video is an interview with my friend mike steen now mike steen is known as the funeral director to the stars that's according to gq magazine and I've known Mike for about 25 years. We first met in a, a social group in the early days of the internet called the Hollywood Underground that was established by our mutual friend, uh, Karen McHale. And Mike's been in the funeral business for years, for decades and decades, so 58 years, I think he said he's, he's been in the business. And Mike intimately you know, worked on celebrity funerals like Natalie Wood, like John Belushi, like like Bob Crane, and there's so many interesting stories he's got. And it turns out now that we've moved to the desert, I live really close to Mike, and I asked Mike if he wouldn't mind sitting down with me and uh, and having a chat and talking about his uh, his career. And, you know, he worked at Westwood Cemetery, and that's where Marilyn's buried, and he has great stories about Marilyn, particularly the guy that's buried or in, in a crypt above Marilyn and what happened to him after he died. That's a very interesting story to, uh, to tune in for. But today's uh, chat is with Mike Steen, and I appreciate Mike uh, sitting down with us. So join me and the funeral director to the stars. So it's it's not really a talk show format, you know. It feels that way right now, but it really isn't. It's just I want to say, well, here we're here today, you know. It's not like that. No, it's just it's just conversational. So sure. it, it it feels that way. But uh, Mike and I have known each other for, we're trying to figure out exactly when it was, but I found this email between us, it was November 2001. So I think we would have met probably about a month before that at the Hollywood Underground dinner. And the Hollywood Underground was a group of people assembled by the late Karen McHale of, uh, of grave people, people that were interested in, in finding graves. Yeah. And Mike is, um, well, you, Mike is the author, I gotta show my, my, my books, Hollywood <laughs> celebrity death certificates one, two, and three. But these three are they're they're like I don't know. I I, I hate when people say Bible because it um, it just it's you overused. I think when people say this is the Bible of. But death certificates are important pieces of information. It documents the last thing somebody did and what what happens to their mortal remains. Really, and a lot of people when they go through it go, I didn't know he died. I didn't know she died. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, and some of them, there's no doubt, no, I mean, some of them are like, well, see, you've got a, such a selection of people here. I'm just going through this, uh, through the volume three, and you've got Robert Armstrong, Eddie, Edward Arnold, Agnes Ayers. I mean, these are wonderful, and, uh, and um, I don't want to say obscure, but they're really not, they're not the Sorrel book. You know, these are Smiley Burnett. They're not the first people you go to. You know, everyone's going. This is the last of my collection. That's why it's large and has obscure people. It's, I mean, Yvonne DiCarlo, Sandra D. These are great. But your first one knocked off like sort of the, the biggies at yes. the time. You're talking Marilyn Monroe. Here's Jan Janet Gaynor, the winner of the first Academy Award for Best Actress. Peter Duell, James Dean. Oh, that's a nice James Dean copy. I don't have one. Is that nice? <laughs> Dorothy Dandridge, Fanny Bryce. I mean, John Blue. Lucy Marilyn is in here, no doubt. Fred Astaire, and a lot of these people. Are your name is your name on any death certificates? No, okay. because uh, the son of the owner and I embalmed John Belushi, but he got his name on the certificate. Okay, so you, you I, I didn't mean like he died, like your name is not, like <laughs> this is my death certificate. But but the person who was responsible for the disposition, when, when bodies are released to the... The embalmer is the only thing that has a signature. Okay. Otherwise, just a funeral home name. Okay, now you're not an embalmer, or are you an embalmer? Oh yes, since you're, 71. You are, you are, since 1931, an actual embalmer. I, I pay my license fee every year. I haven't embalmed a body since 1985. Okay. Then you got into the funeral director business, right? The, I mean, the um, Because family. somebody said, you know, advancement comes from the front office, not the back. Uh, I loved the embalming uh, because I could take somebody from the nursing home 
and work my magic or theirs and make them look like grandma that they remembered not the feeble creature that was there at the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're you're restoring. It's, re it's restoration, isn't that pretty much what it is? Preservation and restoration for viewing. That's and, it. Um, and I imagine that you've, had, you've dealt with some pretty challenging projects. Not as much as one might think, or as much as you see on television. Mm -hmm. You know, upon occasion, there was a little more than was necessary. When I was in mortuary school, a long time ago, we had a student that was a night embalmer at Pierce Brothers, and he would brag about he knocked one out in 40 minutes last night. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, is that all this family deserved is 40 minutes of your very valuable time? And does it look like a 40 minute job? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that makes sense. You put care into it. and But it's also the industry has sort of taken the care out of it, too, hasn't it? Well, I want to say they're kind of their own worst enemy, and I don't know how you roll the clock back. My father died 58 years ago. His funeral, with the casket included, was $720. That same funeral today would be over $10,000. Mm -hmm. So you need to see the value in money spent or have that kind of cash available at a moment's notice. I remember that probably 20 years ago, Hollywood Cemetery was, it was like less than a grand to get it done, cremation yeah. and disposition. Uh, that's changed considerably. And so has property value, <laughs> especially at the A-list cemetery, such sure. as, you know, such as Hollywood Cemetery, which took a long time for that to come around. But where you were, Westwood, that was cream of the crop. Even when you got put them there, on the, on the map. Yeah, but when you got there, it was already top of the list. Oh yes, and then and now it's astronomical uh, how Westwood Cemetery is. And how would you like to to anyone who doesn't know right off the top of their head? How would you describe Westwood Memorial Park? It used to go all the way out from where it was to Wilshire Boulevard. Oh, did and it? And they sold that frontage off during the Depression, and then moved however many bodies were there into the now the main proper of the cemetery that's really interesting because they, they, they it's around it's a big square with graves in the square and then on the perimeter and it's like an acre isn't it or is it three acres uh, or? i thought it's three acres yeah so they they sold off the most valuable part of it yes and they've made it so you really have to go down an alley to get to it right now. but yet it's probably the most expensive real estate in, in Los Angeles. <laughs> it's amazing how many people would call for directions, and I'd give it to them, and they'd say, there's no cemetery there. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you did, I would say if you didn't know where it was, you wouldn't know where it no. is. You wouldn't be able to get there if you did not know exactly where you were going. It's very uh, easy to miss it. But behind the gates are, you know, it's, some, it's a prestigious cemetery. Uh, I was reading an article about you, and the article, which, what magazine was this in? GQ. It was a GQ magazine. Yeah. The, um, and this was in 1976, wasn't it? No, this one's 89. Oh, 89, okay. And at this point, you said, at Westwood Cemetery, a lot, 3 by 8 be nine to 13000 Now, I think I remember the value of the one in front of Maryland, and this would have been... Uh, you know, that wasn't even space that you would sell at that point. That was just, you know, standing yes. space. But I think it was 450000 for that same one lot at, the, at that point in front of Maryland. It was the A-lister. Well, when I got there in 74, the graves in the circle, which or the square, which was the premium, were $3,000. Yeah, that's, that's quite different than nowadays, <laughs> for sure. Um, I was reading in your bio that you, uh, you grew up in Nebraska. Yes. And you, where did you go to mortuary school or funeral school? That's what brought me to Los Angeles. Yeah. There used to be a college across from the General Hospital on Marengo called the California College of Mortuary Science. And what brought you to Westwood in particular? Uh, my friend Bill Jay, who was a casket salesman for Batesville Casket Company, recommended me to Jim Pierce because one of their directors had died, so they had need of one to fill out the team. 
and Bill said, this is the guy you want to get. Wow. What a, what a fortuitous conversation. Yeah. I mean, to end up, that's like the, you know, that's like going to, I don't even know what to say, like the White House of cemeteries, <laughs> you know what I mean? It is in Los Angeles as far as prestige goes, as far as profile goes. I mean, you've got, you know, the forest lawns are, are of a different thing because they were, it's a whole different yeah. animal. You know, Westwood is so concentrated and so it's like a power list of people that are in there. It wasn't always that way. Today it's it's crazy over the top the way it's gone. When you were there, it was only twelve years after Marilyn died mm -hmm. and it wasn't really the place to be yet, like it's right. become. <clears throat> At it was so when so when you were there, when you when you got to Westwood, um and what, what what was in your mind as far as going there? Like this is this is. Well, I went from a firm doing ninety two a year to one doing ninety two a month. Mm -hmm. it's, but much of it was cremation because they were associated with the Los Angeles Funeral Society. So we would do a simple cremation for a hundred and ninety nine dollars, and if you wanted the urn. The cremated remains scattered at sea. It was two hundred and fifty-five dollars. The amount Social Security paid. Interesting. They um, <clears throat> the place was pretty. So who were the aside from Maryland, which is the one? You know, I mean that's that cemetery really put her, put a cemetery in the map. The earliest burial in that cemetery is in the 1800s, isn't it? I mean, it was 1905. Oh, 1905. Okay, so <clears throat> it existed for 60 years before Maryland, or you know, that was the neighborhood cemetery. Yeah, yeah, and then Maryland, you know, went there. We know that she visited her own relatives there, which is why DiMaggio and Bernice, uh, her stepsister, chose that place for her. But after that. You know, when did the ball get rolling with, with the celebrities there, do you know? I can't recall the exact time. But it was right around when I got there. The first celebrity I had was Richard Conti. Some of these names, it's like, okay, tell me, you said Sebastian Cabot. For those of you who don't know, Sebastian Cabot is Mr. French. And also, he did that Unknown Mystery show, which was, I love right. that show. He had died in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And they flew him to us because they thought there would be a big funeral for him. Sixteen people showed up. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. And then we cremated him, and he's in the urn garden. That's a that's a really interesting. So you call that you know? I always wondered about that. I know that when when you know there's walls of niches, and they call them columbariums. If they're in the ground, are they considered columbariums? No. Okay, that's only above ground. Right. Isol okay, I wasn't sure. And because um, that, that it's such an inter... I don't... Sebastian Cabot is such an interesting place. That area, it's all just like a checkerboard, like tiles. Yes. And uh, so Sebastian Cabot, and then... I want to go down. I want to, there's a couple of other ones before. Oh, you know, Troy brought up something. It was curious. Going back to just just general uh, uh, funeral business. Uh, we all know the process of embalming and there's cremation. People being put on display for, you know, <laughs> for visitation. Is there a, you know, it's become kind of popular for people to be buried in their cars and, and you know, in motorcycles and things like that. That happens That's, occasionally. So if you wanted to be like you there you'll see the people that have been embalmed and they're sitting at a table with a cigarette in their hand and you know they always put glasses on because eyes are hard to do <laughs> you know you could you could just do that if you wanted to if the cemetery will permit it. every yeah. cemetery has their own rules and regulations but legally you could do it oh yes anywhere there's nothing to prevent not anywhere because you can't decide that that's where you want to have you know grandma sitting in a rocking chair in the backyard it has to be a cemetery. Mm -hmm. Is there an embalming room at Westwood? Oh, yes. And where is that? Is it behind the office? Is it behind the restrooms or the chapel? It would be uh, next to the chapel. It's on that part of the, of the main building. And the chapel, is it true that the chapel opened Maryland's was the first funeral there? That I don't think is the truth of, but I can't swear to it either way. Yeah. I've never heard that. I read recently that the chapel <clears> opened <throat> in the late 50s 
but the story has always been that I've ever read, which I'm not stating it as truth, I'm just stating it's what I've ever read, is that the, 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 the chapel was not completed yet. And the set decorator from Fox came in and dressed it up to make it look presentable for her funeral. And then when, you know, after the funeral, they just left and took everything with them. But, uh, but then I read recently that it, that it opened in the late 50s. So I was just curious if you knew that to be. Uh, no, I don't think I ever asked. Okay, so I have to ask you, what did you do to poor Peter Lawford? You evicted him from the cemetery. <laughs> the story that I was always told is that Elizabeth Taylor gave his wife money to pay the funeral and cemetery expenses, and she simply never did. That makes sense. And we didn't evict him, but like twice a year we would send her a statement, you mm -hmm. know, kind of a reminder that we haven't been paid yet. So Peter Lawford was <clears throat> the part of the original Rat Pack, kind of like the, I don't know, they threw him a bone and said you could be a member or something, but he really wasn't. He was, they, he was Sinatra being so enamored with Kennedy and uh, JFK, who was married, he was married to Kennedy's sister, Peter Lawford, who I, I quite liked as an actor. I thought he was pretty cool and I thought he was a good looking guy. And then he was sort of extricated or from the from the Rat Pack and um, had kind of a dismal last few years of his life. And he was married to a woman named Patricia Seaton Lawford. And she, he was, that would be his widow. She would have been his widow. And she claimed that Westwood Cemetery evicted Peter Lawford for lack of payment. No, because I was the one that dealt with her. R directly dealt yes. with her, right. And... I don't know whether the National Enquirer went to her or she went to them and said, will you pay to have him removed and then the boat and the scattering at sea, which is what had happened. Yeah. But she wanted the priest to come and bless him one more time. So we scheduled a time, news media all over the place, and she comes in the largest white stretch limousine I'm sure that was available in the city 20 minutes late and then she gets out and goes oh, the media how did they find out about this and I thought <laughs> probably because you've been on the phone since <laughs> seven o'clock this morning calling everybody so the priest blessed him and they whisked him away and uh, scattered him at sea so she was I, I believe as I understand it <clears throat> She, well, I know she wrote a book called The Peter Lawford Story, and it's one of the trashiest books I've read. It's one of my favorites because it's so trashy. But, yeah, as I understand it, um, she made a deal with the Inquirer that they would pay the expenses to have him exhumed, taken and rented the boat and the limo, and, and to coincide with the release of her book, which ironically happened like a year later, you know, it, it didn't go in a short memory. That's <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a story that sticks in my <clears throat> in my brain quite li quite uh, vividly. I say lividly, quite quite uh, quite vividly because uh, um, of how poorly timed it was and how trashy it was. Because in her book, she even said that when Peter Lauper died, Jackie Kennedy called her to console her, and it's like, well, yeah, that happened. I'm sure. I mean, there was. <laughs> Such a trashy book, such a trashy book. I know Bill, or I've met Bill once or twice, and you guys were together almost 50 years. 50 you? years and 29 days. That's that's amazing. Now, you can you tell briefly what you have put on Bill's uh, memorial? Uh, what... You you're very proud of this, and I think it's such an amazing accomplishment. Would you, would you explain what Bill okay. did? It has... William H. Bill Schneed, Ph.D., and 1942 and uh, 2022. And he personally uncovered a $6 billion fraud against the federal government. This is your husband? Yes. Tell, so, so, can you go into that a, a little bit? A Marine friend, retired, came to visit, and he brought a little jar of cream like you think makeup would be in. It's like that. And he said, I never use it. I never saw a doctor for it, but I get $300 a month for ordering it. So that got the hackles of Bill's neck up. That's called a Gorney reflex. And he called somebody at the insurance company 
and got them as excited about it as he was. And because those four things happened, the stars aligned, 345 people are in prison this morning for defrauding the government of $6 billion. They were charging, charging $14,000 for that little jar of cream. Okay. That's what a, what a, there's a legacy, you know? And I was in hopes that he would get a 10% finder's fee. I was going to say, no, you get a commission for sure. <laughs> but to be a whistleblower, you must be an employee. So oh. that didn't count. But they did send him a check for $78,000. Nice. That's something. And we didn't send it back because it wasn't big enough. <laughs> God, that's incredible, though. What an accomplishment. That's that's such a... Um, that's for the history books, literally for the history books. That's fantastic. I want to ask you about some of the people that you whose funerals you handled. And one of them was little Heather O'Rourke. Yes. And uh, and that happened rather suddenly. What was what was that process? What well, was that? she died in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So that was all done from a San Diego funeral home and they just brought her to us to Westwood for an entombment. And that's Westwood is you know, even back then, Westwood was top of the cream of the crop. So this little blonde girl who was in a couple of movies, all of a sudden is getting this this crypt, which is, you know, nowadays, it's it's easily probably a million or 750 uh, to a million for, for that property. How do you, Who do you think paid for that? Her folks did. Where do you think, you know, I mean, that's a lot of money. Oh, but it wasn't it. A lot of money to me is relative. If you've got 50 cents in your pocket, $100 is a lot of money. Yeah. So I never confused simple with cheap. You know, a solid mahogany is simple. It's not cheap. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and it's all relative. And it was expensive at that time for what they got, but it wasn't outrageous. It's not, I guess it's incredulous to me as an outsider. You know, here's a family from San Diego whose daughter is successful, and all of a sudden getting this this crypt in this A-list cemetery nowhere near where their family lives or is from, and uh, so it just that's all. It's me questioning, asking the question. That's what it is. The you met with their family? No, I did not. Okay. Because there's lots of rumors about her. Uh, I was uh, at the entombment is my only part of it. I see. I see. So you weren't the person they spoke to. There are no business arrangements done through you. No. You dealt with the, oof, I don't want to say social aspect, but really, honestly, that's what it was. You were the caring. You were the family representative. <laughs> you, were, you, weren't, uh, you were not doing the paperwork. No, you I were was not selling them anything. No. I was the assistant funeral director, as it were. Bill Pierce, the son of... Jim Pierce was the main funeral director for her. Okay. Okay. So another, okay. So we talked about Peter Lawford and we talked about, um, about Heather O'Rourke. Tell me about Truman Capote. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a wild story. He died while I was working for Pierce Brothers. And then when Pierce Brothers bought Westwood, then they brought me back as the first manager. And so he was, the urn was at Joanna Carson, the first Mrs. Johnny Carson's home. So Truman died and she got his, his cremates. She got half. His boyfriend in New York got the other half. Okay. And they had him on the mantle in his room at her home. And he was stolen during a Halloween party and brought back four days later and put on her back porch. <laughs> but she realized he wasn't safe there anymore. Mm-hmm. And so she called me and said that she needed to come and buy property. Now, you know I don't have very much money anymore. Well, we're back to relativity. So she comes over, and we're walking around the square, and she's talking about him, how wonderful and how special. And she's about to the point where her eyes are glazing over. And she says he needs, he needs something like, the true of the wall. <laughs> dramatic of it yeah and she did wind up buying a large couch crypt mm -hmm. on the second level for this small urn and i believe that then it was worth a hundred thousand and i think bill pierce let her have it 
for 10000 Oh, wow. Just to have him in the park. She made out like a bandit with her marriage from Johnny Carson. How could she not have any money? That's so well, funny. Well, it's relative, like you said. And now uh, she has since died and was cremated, and so her urn is also in there with him. He, I saw that recently, that Joanna Carson and uh, and uh, Truman Capote are together now. And Truman's other half is with his other half. I mean, and buried in... Uh, I don't know, like back east, like yeah. New England, somewhere in New England, Connecticut, or something like that. But uh, but what a great story! So they have you ever been? There have been grave robberies, you know, like like Groucho Marx was stolen from from his crypt or his niche at uh, Eden, Eden Eden Memorial Park, and uh, and there was the other story about. Uh, I think it had to do with Eden as well. Was um, George Tobias who who whose body was in a hearse that was stolen and uh and and you know but has anything like that ever happened in any of no. the cemeteries you ever worked in no i don't ever remember a, even hearing about one locally mm -hmm. but there's so much security precautions okay well, well maryland is her own thing that, that is like a whole different thing we'll get into that most definitely but i want to hit a couple of the <laughs> i want to hit a couple of the other ones because i know you've got great stories about that cemetery and and especially her but let, let's go into some of these other names so what about um what about dorothy stratton the murder victim we had a funeral for her in the chapel memorial service and while the service was going on, we brought her casketed body to the grave. They got a full-size grave for her, and Peter Bogdanovich bought that, and he also bought the one next to it for himself, and then he married her sister. <laughs> yeah. That's a little too strange for me. It looks so much like her. And he is now buried next to her. To Dorothy. And the sister is somewhere else. But yeah, that, that's a fascinating story. So Dorothy Stratton's terrible, you know, story. Her, her, she was murdered by her boyfriend Paul Snyder, ex-husband rather. No, still husband, I think. They yeah. weren't divorced yet, and uh, and it's like, okay, so it was a murder suicide, and it must have been her mother that handled the array. No, Bogdanovich. Bogdanovich did. She was Canadian as well, and she was also cremated. Really? Yes. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Bill Pierce picked her up from the coroner's office took her directly to the crematory and then it was the urn in this beautiful mahogany casket oh fascinating so she's buried in a casket but she's cremated yes wow and they spent a fortune on that casket yes no kidding <laughs> that's fascinating is that common i never i've never heard of that but it makes sense it makes total sense it happens upon occasion huh I think I've done only two or three is is all. Got it. Westward, you're thinking, like, I bought that space. I'm using every <laughs> inch of it. Because <laughs> you know? so Bogdanovich then, yeah, he, he died last year, I think, or very, you know, within the last couple of years. And he's buried next to her, which sort of surprised me. Because there's a litany it's on, that is her her, memor her plaque or her, uh, her, her marker. It's death will come, you know for everyone at some time and even if you're a good person don't worry it'll come for you too i think it's a shakespeare quote or something but Could be. it's such a whew, yeah, that, <laughs> that's not very optimistic but then her her circumstances were were not nice so i'm sure bogdanovich was very bitter at that point but fascinating fascinating uh okay another one i'm going to the two the two that were that i read that you you handled at westwood this is Frank Zappa and Roy Orbison. Both of them are very prominent individuals, and both of them chose not to have their their graves marked. Was right. that? And then George C. Scott is another one whose grave isn't marked. I don't know if you handled his funeral. No. He's probably after you left. But they're all very prominent people who chose to not be marked. I think the the rationale to me is they never could come up with what they wanted to say on it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether they, as time has gone on, they have decided not to do anything or what that was all about. Roy Orbison's funeral was on a very rainy day, a graveside service, and his wife called, I was not the main director, called and spoke to Enoch Glasscock and said, 
you know, I don't think I want the grave that I chose the other day. I'd like to have the other one. Oh, really? <laughs> so we had one already ready for the service, and so we had to go and quickly dig the other one and prepare it instead. What was the turnaround on that, that you had to do that so quickly? Because you had to put a liner in there, I mean, a, a, vault. a vault in there. Um, we had a couple of hours, and that was enough time. Dean Martin? We, was had, his, we had his son while I was there. He was flying a plane for the military and drove in, flew into a mountain. Mm -hmm. And then we had the funeral at the graveside at uh, Los Angeles National Cemetery. And I was told, because it was full at the time, that they took down a tree so there would be space for him. For Dean Paul Martin, killed yeah. in a crash. And then, so so you handled him at Westwood? Yeah. And then took him over to, to the right. veterans cemetery? Because the grandparents were there already. Crichetti's? Yes. And that's why, so it's, now when Dean Martin died then in 1995, do you think he already had that property? Because Dean, Dean Martin's parents are on one side, and on the opposite side, in another area, is where Dean Martin is. Do you think he had that when he died, or no, that would have been a purchase at the time? And then there's the the other the the um, where Robert Stack is, and you handled Robert Stack. Yes. And so he is cremated. Yes, and he and his wife bought the niche before the, his death. Oh, so okay, so it was because I remember when they came in at Westwood. You never knew who was on the other end of the line. Mm -hmm. And I pick it up one day and I hear, this is Gregory Peck. And I want to say, I know that. Nobody sounds like you. <laughs> <laughs> and he had some kind of a question. Mm -hmm. And then I pick it up another day and the voice says, can you keep a secret? Yes. Hangs up. Calls back two minutes later. Can you really keep a secret? Yes. Calls back. Can everybody in your office keep a secret? Yes. And I mean, this went on for... I don't know, eight or ten times, and I finally said, if you tell me who we're talking about, I can tell you what we can do. Well, it was for Paul Newman's son, Scott. Oh, okay. He was, was he killed? Was he killed, or did he did he do it himself? It was a drug overdose. Okay. As was Mary Tyler Moore. Now, you did you thought with her son, didn't you? Yes. And at that time, she was married to Grant Tinker. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Bel Air mansion to make the arrangements there. And she opened the door and said, hi, I'm Mary. And so it was Grant and Mary and Mike for the four or five days. Mm. But I think that she got into the role from ordinary people so she didn't have to face it for herself. That was a rough movie. Yeah, I can see that, actually. Absolutely. That is a fascinating idea yeah and then i took the urn back to the house and so in her autobiography i think i'm listed as the funeral director who brought the urn i'm not named mm -hmm. yeah i never thought about that before that movie ordinary people is a rough movie to watch if you're going in there expecting to see laura you know petrie or mary richards and it's a whole different thing so that was her processing the the death of her mm -hmm. son um Wow, that's fascinating. Now, a couple of other names. I, I, I was shocked about Belushi. You dealt with John Belushi's body. What what was what, what happened? What how did and what? Well, we got him from the coroner's office, and Bill Pierce and I embalmed him. And then, this part of it is a little hazy to me. But what I was told is that we used Clint Eastwood's private jet to fly him to New York. And I had a funeral director there, friend of mine, handle it on that end. Mm -hmm. And then I think he's buried in upstate New York, if I'm not mistaken. Somewhere Massachusetts or somewhere like that. What would Clint Eastwood have to do with it? I'm curious. I think he just offered his jet. The So what do you remember about that? There had to be, I mean, these are high profile. And I'm sure people were hounding his corpse. You know, they wanted to know where he was at every moment. Since uh, since he died at the Chateau Marmont, overdosed there, gone to the LA County Coroner, and then taken to Westwood and embalmed. Did they... He went to New York on a stretcher because the plane wasn't large enough to accommodate a casket. Okay, not even in shipping? No. Hmm. Oh, if it was Clint Eastwood's private plane, then yes, that makes yeah. sense. I guess that would make sense. It's just 
not what you would think huh do you have um wow okay yeah what's your did they bring in like so was he embalmed he was embalmed but he was just on a stretcher yeah interesting that's fascinating okay tell me about uh fred astaire i was the funeral director for that for him and uh, his wife wanted it you know very simple again what what is simple and so she had a a nice casket for him she didn't want to have a vault and i kind of nudged her in the proper direction that he should have one and she wanted oakdale cemetery in chatsworth to close down for the day and they wouldn't accommodate her they said we'll keep his area free but we can't close the cemetery for him okay yeah that's interesting i don't know why well and she was it, quite young wasn't she yeah there was a uh, one limousine with her and i don't know five or six other people and that's all that were at the service mm -hmm. and he had someone else that was buried there uh was bob crane at yes. that time and he all, and his wife already had a grave at westwood but the father had died and the mother tried to take over when i heard what she was making other plans and another firm to take care of them and i knew i was going to get a call from his wife because we had built a nice rapport mm -hmm. and sure enough she called and said you know mother has taken over and it's not the plans that i want so i called the funeral home that the mother had selected and i said uh, they've decided to come with us instead so they called the transport service that were on their way to get him in Phoenix and told him to bring him to us. To Westwood. To Westwood. But buried in Oakwood. He because the father was there and he wanted to accom she wanted to accommodate her mother in law. But as soon as the mother in law died, then she had him removed and brought to Westwood to his grave. Okay. Sigrid Sigrid was her name Sigrid Val Valdis or something like that? It's, she was, I mean, you saw, it, like, she was on Hogan's Heroes. And it says that right on her grave. There's pictures, you know, together again, Hilda and so-and-so. I think her name is Sigrid Valdis or something to that. If I, what, yeah. How did you know her name? Uh, did you know her name? Do you remember her name? It's probably a stage name. Probably sounds nicer. I really don't. Okay. But we enjoyed the, the time we spent with each other, and I was glad to help them, and I got them exactly what they wanted, which is the whole goal I had mm -hmm. okay now with, this is a big one this is Natalie Wood we got to talk about Natalie Wood that was such a, a tragic situation and we had met the family the year before when her father died so we knew who they all were and they knew all of us and it was going to be a graveside service and Bill Pierce did most of it my only part was that one of the helpful friends and came in literally 20 minutes before the graveside service was to start and he wanted me to find a handsome well-dressed unobtrusive paramedic to sit next to her mother in case she needed something okay <laughs> <laughs> and i did have some paramedic friends but they were all working mm -hmm. and i said she's a stoic russian woman She's not going to let herself get out of control. And the very last thing she would want is for you to know she needed something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how it worked out. Okay. All right. So when it came about that she, when Natalie Wood died, what was the process? Do you remember that, that uh, you know, obviously she went to the coroner. It was autopsied. And uh, is, is Catalina in L.A. County? Would it have been an L.A. County coroner case? yes it would have been okay and then you got the call from from the robert wagner mm -hmm. and uh, bill pierce picked her up at the coroner's office and he did the preparation himself and everything he he dressed her and cosmetized her and uh, she looked really lovely what condition was she in when they brought her in? I mean, she wasn't in the water all that long, no, no, so she, she couldn't. Was, have... She was fine. Okay, but and then so she had. Um, a, when a normal 
normal. What what is normal? When a person has a a, a standard autopsy, you know, there's the Y incision. There's mm -hmm. the uh, that they open up the chest. Now Natalie had tissue samples taken, and she was also you know heavy bruising and 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 things like that. Um, how did how did the cemetery you know the process how did the embalming process handle all well, that? It, it didn't hinder the embalming process at all, I want to say. Since I didn't do it, I can't speak totally of it. But it, those kinds of things are easily covered up. Mm -hmm. And what was she wearing? Her beautiful red fox fur. Yeah? Like a, like a shawl or a stole? No. Or? It was a jacket. Mm -hmm. and, but regular, uh, nice, elegant street clothing. Mm-hmm. And then this beautiful jacket. Like, did was it a long jacket? Did it go all the way down to her wrists, or? Yes. Okay. So it wasn't a stole. And she was wearing anything? Was she besides her dress? I mean, she have jewelry on her. I anything? just saw her for a brief time, and I wasn't taking inventory. But I, I my guess is that there were some some jewelry too. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And there was a lot of press. How did the cemetery handle heavy press? Well, we can eliminate who gets in the gate. So we can keep people out and, and lock the gate, literally. Mm -hmm. But uh, with photo lenses, they can be three blocks away and find the fly on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. And we can't stop that. But we can stop what they get in the park. Do you remember the um, some of the people that were there? The cemetery? I didn't go out, so I don't know who was there. Okay. Because I have a list. I just wonder if you had any. Because I, I, I um, there was there was a, a fascinating group of people that were there at the cemetery: uh, Sinatra, Elizabeth Taylor, Fred Astaire, Rock Hudson, Gregory Peck, Gene Kelly, Ely Kazan, Laurence Olivier. Didn't make it. Wanted to. Uh, Hope Lang, Roddy McDowell. I mean, it, it's just it's an insane amount of people. It's a list of who's who. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And one of the things that was written in here, which I thought you would be interested to know. And uh, this is a quote from Robert Wagner's biography, autobiography. He distinctly remembers buying a double plot, but the cemetery contended that I didn't, and they lost the records. Years later, they offered to exhume Natalie and move her to another spot where we could be buried together, but I didn't want to do that. I just let it go. Does that sound familiar? Not this is what he says, because he's... Not a bit. I... I find it hard to believe that they would have lost the records. And I remember he bought a double grave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't. Uh, it's an odd thing to write. Yeah. Because I don't think. You, we, it, it's it's typical. Like something that somebody would have died in the 20s, or 30s, or the 40s. The, the records are lost. You know, there was a fire, there was a flood. There's well, always something like that. But it's not that long ago. No. And, you know, I understand a fire and a flood. Yeah, but just lost because we kept way too good records for that. That's it was nineteen eighty two, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Mm -mm. So that's that's why it kind of made me kind of go. No, it doesn't sound quite right. Interjecting quickly, this audio clip is a question I asked Mike after our interview for this portion of the video. I forgot to ask him about Natalie Wood's autopsy, her body parts, and what happens to her body parts after burial. So I went back to Mike and asked him this quick question, audio only. Everything in the world is going to start making noises right now. <laughs> That's just the way this is. I forgot to ask you when you were over about the... Uh, about the organs so after an autopsy when someone's autopsied uh, a lot of times the coroner will maintain you know a collection of tissues be them you know in her case I think scars I think pieces of bruises and flesh you know pieces of organ stuff when they check all this stuff out and when they can when they have the opportunity I mean what do they do with the organs do they give them back to you or oh yes they give them back to us put inside back in the body and that's how they come to us then we take them out, treat them with a preservative, and then some people put them back in. I preferred to put them in a heavy duty plastic bag at the foot of the casket. So if you still had the body, you'll, it's open, a Y incision from autopsy. So you'll open it back up and you'll put them in with them. Yes. Like a, like, 
like a turkey for really, really. Yeah. Uh, and then, but if there's an opportunity, it's like, for instance, do they ever return organs after the person's buried? I'm not aware of it. I'm sure it has happened. Mm-hmm. But I'm not aware of it because then it's, what do we do? Do we cremate them and bury the the residue on top of the casket? Because you wouldn't go to the expense to bring the casket up just to return a few pieces. Right. But the family would, the family must be notified, though, right? Oh, yes. They have to be notified of body parts. I kept every right? family uh, aware every step of the way. So in her case, you, you, she's, her organs or whatever they took for samples are in a bag at the foot of her casket. Well, I think Bill Pierce preferred to put them back in the body. Oh, okay, okay. But you have put them in bags. Oh, yes, for, that's my preference. Cases. Okay. Um, okay, so then we'll go on to the the um, the the grand the grand dome of Westwood Cemetery, Marilyn Monroe. So Marilyn died in sixty two. She died in sixty two, uh, right? And uh, funeral well documented as far as her, you know, because you weren't there for the funeral. Uh, you were you were there for you were you got to the cemetery twelve years after Marilyn died, but the aftermath or the you know there was Marilyn. Is the thing. She had visitors literally every day. And the people who said, I was in your country and I couldn't go home until you had seen this. I thought, there's a whole lot of things in this country Mm -hmm. (laughs) more interesting than this, certainly to me. But if this was a high point in your trip, that's fine. Yeah. That was a big thing for me when I first came to L.A. The first time I visited Hollywood in the 80s, I was like going to see Marilyn's grave. Man, that was that was something. And there wasn't any Internet back then, so you really felt like you were discovering something. Mm-hmm. There's not much more to discover anymore. But but back then, you were like, this is wild. You know, people were going into cemeteries. And and uh, so Westwood is, is such a destination you know, yes. people, there's so many places that have maps to it now, and when you go in there at any given time nowadays, there's 20, 30 people, really, almost every day at a time, going from, you know, greatest hit to greatest hit. But anyway, on to Maryland. So you knew Alan Abbott, who dealt with that, mm-hmm. too, didn't you? Mrs. Hamrock, who yeah. who is the person who... Um, uh, who forever stuffed Marilyn's bra <laughs> with cotton, <laughs> and, and um, but now what do you remember as far as the tourism goes? We know that Marilyn's grave is a popular destination. We also know that the grave has been the, the cover of the of the crypt has been replaced several times, as has her nameplate. Well, how did the cemetery deal with that? I mean, what did you? What was? Well, it's a small price to pay for having her, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Yes, sometimes it gets so lip, lipstick stained that it has to be replaced, and there have been attempts to take the nameplate. Yeah, I mean there are there are nameplates, and there's the funeral museum in Texas has one. Uh, they have well, they have one of the original uh, what Crip, is crypt plate or crypt fronts? Crip front. They have one of those because they get so stained with yeah. people's uh with lipstick people kiss them and they get gross and that's why i never they really it deteriorates mm-hmm. it, it does like yeah so what is so has anything ever really weird happened at maryland's grave uh westwood always keeps an extra nameplate mm-hmm. in case of a catastrophe or a theft but so you know, there's been there's one video on youtube that um uh, i think there's a person below maryland Oh, is she the second or the third? Second. second. The person below Marilyn, they opened it for some reason. No one was in it yet. And they opened it and they cleaned it out. And there was so much stuff that was like stuck in Marilyn's that slid down, you know, down to this. It was like, you know, probably postcards and things like that. You know, people. Oh, yeah. You guys have lunch if you're oh, going to dig. <laughs> that oh, right there, Marilyn Monroe. I, mean, I know, I know. I'm just making it's, bad uh, jokes here, but. Wow. So nobody is in there, but they said Hugh Hefner is going to be there? This one. Hugh Hefner will be over there. Yeah, he can. But Marilyn is right behind that. Yeah, right here. Right. that little piece of cement there. Yep. She's such a focal point, and, uh, and yeah, people are always leaving stuff. I mean, have if if you ever got into work one day and go, what, what, what is that? 
you know, to, I mean, not necessarily even in Maryland's, but at any of those places, at any of the cemeteries you've ever worked in. Oh, yes. But I quit trying to figure people out a long time ago. So the uh, so really, I mean, Maryland was the was the a list or the draw for a lot of people and the draw for the cemetery, because that's what put the cemetery. Yeah. That's what elevated into the stratosphere in the price bracket stratosphere, <laughs> too, you know, because there was no one before her as far as prominent people. Oh, no. And uh, and her aunt. Anna Lower, and I think Bernice, I forget what the other two, she had an aunt and a godmother that were there, and uh, and that's why DiMaggio and her sister uh, decided on the place. But then after that, it's like floodgates are open. And, um, I mean, it's, uh, to say, I mean, just Ryan O'Neill the other day was put there next to Farrah Fawcett, which is where Rodney Dangerfield and Merv Griffin and... And, uh, um, you know, Dominique Dunn is another one that you, mm -hmm. you helped with, didn't you? you? I didn't have much to do with that one. Mm -hmm. Again, I think Bill Pierce took care of her service. Mm -hmm. but she's cremated and is in this in the square. But she's, but she's got a, she, so she's not in a casket. She's cremated in an urn. But she's got a full-size memorial, right. a tablet. Okay. Um uh, it's like Natalie Wood, now Bob Crane, Truman Capote, Ava Gabor, uh, John Cassavetti, Sebastian Cabot. Uh, oh my gosh, there's so <laughs> many. And that's Daryl Zanuck. Is he? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, is it Daryl Zanuck? Is there? He is. Uh, we don't want to leave Maryland without talking about Poncher. For okay, no, we're not going <laughs> to. That's. I think that's a great way to to end this actually, because you've been so generous with your time. So tell tell. Mr. Poncher bought the grit, the crypt above Maryland. And his long-term wish was to be entombed face down. So we had the funeral for him, and then I had all the family and the friends exit the building. We did open the casket, turn him upside down, and then had the family come back in to see that we had really done it. And then we walked over to the crypt, and he was placed. So, so his widow, with his widow's permission, you, you literally picked him up, and you did this. You I did. You physically did this. And My you, own two paws. And he's facing <laughs> down now on top of Maryland forever. Yes. And, you know, another name that comes to mind was Nan, uh, Minnie Ripperton. Did yes. You, did, you, did you help with her um, service? I did. I had been over to the health department in Santa Monica, and I came in the cemetery, and there was another car there, and somebody, a couple of people, I think it was both gentlemen, just kind of beginning to walk around. So I went up and introduced myself and said, could I help you? And he said he was looking for a pre grave that his wife was terminally ill when he wanted to get this taken care of. So we picked out the location he wanted and within a few days I get a call and he was a really nice guy and he wanted me to select everything. The casket, the vault, the works. I just want a funeral that nobody can complain about because her family had wanted to take him back to Chicago and they lived within blocks of the cemetery and he thought it was important for the kids if they wanted to visit that they'd be able to. And she, that's why they chose L.A. Yeah. Yeah, and one of her child is now, we know, is Maya Rudolph. Right. From, uh, the and Comic so Anthers. I chose similar casket and vault to what my mother has mm -hmm. and uh, blind gentleman celebrity uh, was a pallbearer which does not work real well even if you put him in the middle i'm trying to think of like the only person i can think of is ray charles it's blind and sammy i mean um stevie wonder but uh i think it was stevie wonder okay <laughs> And they did fly her minister from Chicago out to officiate at the service. And her marker has the words to loving you is easy because you're beautiful. Do, that do, 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 do. That's distinctive. <laughs> as, as are you. As are you. <laughs> no, this has been great. Thank you, Mike. This, I My really, pleasure. I love to get the stories out. I um, Yeah, we're going to... This, this is... I think people will be really... Really fast. Within days of fifty-eight years, that's that's a long time, and it doesn't feel like that at all. No, and I think it's fortuitous that we end up being neighbors. I love that. 
Um, so you obviously, I don't think, but I will ask you, do you have any regrets about what you've done? And, and Oh, not a day's worth. No. I served literally thousands of families very well, got them through one of the most difficult times of their lives, and uh, never a day I didn't want to go to work. I was where I was supposed to be, and the 18th of the month will be my 58th year of walking in the door at Latin Dugan Chambers, and within 30 minutes I knew I was home and where I belonged. That's nice. Thank you very much for your uh, for coming to, to spend time with us. I'm very happy to do it, and I hope your viewers enjoy the, the time we spent, too. I have no doubt. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mike. Thank you. If you want to hear more about Marilyn Monroe's actual embalming process by one of the embalmers, Alan Abbott was a man I interviewed a few years ago, and here's a link now if you look at the screen to Alan Abbott's interview about the embalming of Marilyn Monroe back in 1962. You heard me.